We looked back then and said, it's clear that the science has gotten way ahead of the manufacturing when it comes to cells, tissues, and organs. Uh, every other industry, you know, they, they won the Nobel Prize in the late 40s and 50s at Bell Labs for figuring out how to make a transistor, but within a decade, there was Silicon Valley and an infrastructure to, to build the digital world that we know of. A hundred years before that, you know, the first cars became obviously uh, a real deal, and Detroit built an infrastructure, iron and steel and castings and forgings and gears and, well, all the different med schools, all the different research institutions had Petri dishes, you heard Nina talk about it, and Petri dishes and, and pipettes and slave labor like postdocs and grad students that will do all of this work but there's no industry, there's no equivalent of Silicon Valley that will bring the engineering community, the manufacturing community to the world of science. So we told the government, uh, we're gonna make it practical to manufacture high quantity, high quality, reasonable price cells, tissues, and organs. And I've been building dialysis equipment for 30 years and there's 200,000 people waiting for their Kidney transplants and 20% are dying every year and the list gets longer, not shorter. Uh, same thing with waiting for islet cells or a pancreas. People that are waiting for a liver don't have the equivalent of dialysis. So if they're not on that list and lucky enough to get a cadaveric uh, a liver quickly, they die. People are waiting for lungs. So we said, we gotta stop this. And we shouldn't have to wait for people to die in order to let somebody live. Let's just remanufacture organs. And we also said to them right up front, we'll use the iPSCs, the induced pluripotent stem cells, out of the patient that you know will be the recipient to be the cells we put into the printed or by any other means manufactured uh, infrastructure uh, So it's not organ. just any organ, it's your organ. It's your organ. And by the way, in that same press conference, I said to the folks at the White House, uh, even if we're lucky enough that within the five years I told you we'll get something in front of the FDA, we don't even know how they're going to be able to evaluate it because everything they do at the FDA is, it's of course appropriately statistical. You know, if you're going to make 12 billion of these pills, prove that they're the same. I said, we're going to show up at the FDA and say, yeah, we're making organs. And by the way, even though we're going to make 100,000 kidneys, we hope in the first year we get out there with them, each kidney is going to be very specifically different. Each kidney is going to have the DNA of the intended recipient, and it's going to pop out of the oven nice and warm. It's going to be immediately whisked into a surgical field, handed to a surgeon who's going to zip it into the patient, and they go home. Sorry, FDA, there's no way you can be in the middle of that process. Get QA for that person. <laughs> yeah, and so, so we said to them, I said in the White House, unless we start now, we'll be five years ahead of the FDA when we have the capacity to do this. Uh, they're gonna need to come up with a complete regulatory strategy to make this possible. The first full-time employee of Army, I called it Army in respect for the DOD. It wasn't, by the way, HHS or, it wasn't all the places you'd think that we get healthcare funded, National Science Fund. No, it was the Department of Defense that gave us the money because they said, Dean, we need skin, we need bone, we need this stuff. So. I'm down in Washington, we tell that story, and I said the FDA is gonna be the biggest uncertainty in this whole thing. I'm sure the scientists will deliver the recipe to make cells, tissues, and organs. I'm sure we're gonna find a way to do high volume manufacturing to get consistent quality and outcomes and document the thing, but how are we gonna get it approved? A guy that spent 18 years, MD, PhD, at FDA, rising to being the policy director at the CBER, the one third of the FDA that's on that, resigned that day, and uh, moved up to New Hampshire. Coincidence? <laughs> Coincidence, I told him he should resign, get to our side of the table, and help us prepare to help the FDA partner with us to get these things approved. So, so Dr. Richard McFarlane became the first full-time employee of Army. I then said, we need standards. So we went down to Washington. We plucked a few folks out of NIST, the National Institute for Standard and Technology. We got them on board. Army now has 200 member organizations, most of the big med schools, some of the big pharma companies, a lot of little startups, uh, and it has uh, probably about 60 full-time employees across all the disciplines necessary let me, let me make to make this, organs. Let me make this palpable for folks. So we're talking about uh, if you should need a backup, let's list some organs here. First of all, you know, bone, ligament, bone, the work that Nina's doing, skin, 
Uh, a kidney? Kidney is a very, very, very and, and livers and lungs. But we now have a little one that's about to go in front of the FDA. Think about this, people. Uh, most of you hope to live long. We've heard all about longevity. We already know that something that was once considered rare is becoming quite an appropriate fear among people getting older, and that's macular degeneration. Well, instead of building the entire kidney, what if you could make something that's about, oh, a couple of millimeters by a couple of millimeters, and you could slip it in almost non-surgically, uh, attached to a retina, to give somebody essentially their own brand new healthy ability to see. Wow. We have now built a device that's spitting those things out. We're testing them in animals, but I'm believing that within certainly a couple of years that will be in front of the FDA, and your worries about macular degeneration may be substantially reduced.